This is an overview section on all the technologies meant to be very objective, just to sort of lay the landscape, and I'll start out with the obvious, which is PRP. And uh, my uh, conflicts are uh, uh, listed with the Academy, like all speakers are. So this is a, a cute uh, cartoon that I got from Rachel, and, and I think it sort of exemplifies what all of our initiatives are dedicated towards. And we're typically not yet at the level of in injury prevention or disease modification, but we're dealing with a acute or subacute injury. And then we're saying, well, look, how can we harness the body's intrinsic desire to heal, and what can we do exogenously to sort of enhance that, and that can come vis-a-vis -vis either a paracrine effect or growth factors from a variety of sources. And then we're looking for repair. We're looking to shorten the duration of disability, looking to improve an outcome that might otherwise occur, and we're looking either to, uh, as an adjunct to surgical intervention, where biology may be challenged. Uh, there's a litany, uh, Bert did a nice job uh, demonstrating this, but look, everywhere you go, when I drive on uh, 9094 in Chicago going back to my home, uh, I see at least a half a dozen billboards uh, emphasizing uh, crazy things like this that you and I know uh, may have very little scientific validity, yet you continue to see them uh, in an uh, incipient way. Fortunately, from an objective uh, point of view, there's a, uh, it, it's remained a hot topic over all subspecialties, uh, even outside of orthopedics. We've seen exponential growth in the literature, and we continue to do a decent job of trying to do good research, not just reviews, but new research, clinical trials, randomized studies, uh, and so forth. And those are some of the things that you're going to hear today. Now, just PRP. So let's just go over the basics so that this can lay the landscape when you start to hear about the clinical aspects of it. So we have venous blood, and that has cells, red blood cells, white cells, and plasma. It's the plasma portion that's in, of interest, and that's really the non-cellular portion of blood. That's where our platelets are. That's where our growth factors are. So PRP is basically a sample of this plasma with some fold increase in platelets. That's the way you should think about it. It's really quite simple. Platelets, as we know, have these alpha granules, and they don't even need to be really activated by anything exogenously. If they just see collagen, a basement membrane, something, they will degranulate. And that's where we're presumably getting access to a variety of growth factors. There's some uh, question whether or not IGF is actually present or modulated or what have you, but the take home is that there are lots and lots of growth factors that can subsequently be released, and maybe these can be harnessed in sort of a paracrine effect to offer some opportunity to enhance healing or improve an injury situation. There are a number of options, and we're grateful to our number of corporate supporters, and you can walk the hallways there and, and, and look at these different options that are out there, and I may have even missed some, so forgive me if I have. So there are generally two premises. There's either a single spin or a double spin uh, ability to make PRP. And a single spin historically is called a plasma-based system, and a double spin is often called a Buffy code system. And the, basically what happens is these different elements within blood have different specific gravities and they layer out. And the easy way to think about the single spin is that they often have fewer platelets and because of specific gravity, less spin time, fewer white cells, and they often tend to be a little bit less expensive for you in the office or the operating room. Alternatively, those that are double spin phases really have more platelets and more white cells and have a longer, maybe more costly process at hand. So if you just look at what you get as these things layer out, depending on how long they're centrifuge, we typically get the plasma on top, and away from that plasma, we now get white cells, platelets, and red cells. So we're trying to basically take the water or aqueous element out of it to get a concentration of platelets and white cells in vari variable amounts and take away all the other things based on the spin time. One of the consequences of sort of different systems is that if your desire is to say, I want more growth factors, therefore you want to get more platelets, other things kind of go along with it. You, oh, by the way, get more white cells, and you might actually get more red cells the closer you are to the red cell layer, which has a higher specific gravity. So that's why we always say they're not all the same. And there's a tremendous amount of variability in all of these different preparations, which there lies the problem we have with our research, where we're never comparing apples to apples and driving home uh, conclusions based on systematic reviews and so forth becomes particularly challenging given the variability, in addition to the fact that we do a very poor job in actually classifying, identifying, and so forth uh, the different systems that are used. There's heterogeneity in the indications, the processing, the application, the reporting function. So any of you who are interested in this type of research, I would advocate to you that we at the very least quantify and qualify what you're giving your patient at that time by taking an aliquot and saving it and actually analyzing it so we can all begin to include apples to apples when we're publishing our research prospectively. That's the least requirement we have. 
And then there's the added complexity where you think of a joint as an organ. It's not just the cartilage, not just the synovium, not just the fluid. It's the entire organ of a, a, a diarthodial joint that is patho, has pathoanatomy. And you've got all these other factors that you have to take into consideration because it's not likely just the growth factors of the white cells that are making the difference. But at least to try to simplify it, there's a couple of things that, that uh, various authors have recognized. One, that there's a positive correlation between the amount of platelets and the growth factors. Okay, so that's one thing. And we used to say, hey, more is better. That's not always true. This is some work from Jorge Chala and others that have basically shown in vitro or in vivo that when you have more platelets, it actually may not be better. And this uh, uh, dichotomy of high, low dose and high dose is something that's preserved all across orthopedics. We see in stem cell studies and others that more is not necessarily better. So in these two studies basically showed there was slower ligamentization and worse biomechanical properties in a setting where you had more platelets. Now obviously it wasn't just that there were more platelets, there were also probably more white cells and other factors. So you've got to be very careful of what we attribute that to. Uh, some collaboration that Lisa Forty and I conducted a couple of years ago looked at the cellular component and said, look, what's really going on when you change the cellular component absent of what's happening with the platelets? And the general take home, again, is that the more platelets, the more white cells you get. And what are the consequences of that? Well, for example, the more neutrophils, the more catabolic factors that you get. So if there's slower ligamentization or slower healing of an ACL, it may have less to do with the platelets and more to do with the other stuff that goes along with it when you have your concomitant effort to upregulate or increase the fold increase in your platelets. I love this study because it gives something in vitro. It's a study by Connie Chu and Jason Dragu and their co-authors that said, look, let's look at leukocyte poor, leukocyte rich, and co-culture them with synovium and synoviocytes to see what happens to their viability. And in general, the same take home was present, that if you have leukocyte poor PRP, yes, you have fluor uh, platelets, but it's also less inflammatory. Similarly, if you have, uh, and maybe more anti-inflammatory. If you have leukocyte rich, it was more inflammatory and less anti-inflammatory and had direct effects on the synoviocyte viability. So the general take home is this, that if you are, if we're thinking about sort of spins, the number of spins and the platelet fold increase that we're looking for, it's generally considered more anabolic when you have less platelets. In contrast, it's considered generally more catabolic when you get more platelets in the current systems. Now, there are ways that we could probably gate and change the number of white cells and so forth, but that's the general take home for what you have today when working in the office and the operating room setting. I think there's another uh, uh, poorly uh, uh, understood fact about how PRPs actually signal for MSCs. There's some interesting literature that PRP will signal for MSCs in vitro and in vivo to call upon them and actually act to ask them to divide and so forth. So that's another important principle that uh, I think is a take home because those growth factors may have other very important effects uh, peripheral to their primary use in a pericrine, in a pericrine way. So it speaks to this, this emphasis now on classifications. It, it, pretty much every day now I get an email from someone who says, we've got to classify, we've got to classify, we've got to classify. And what do we do it on? Do we do it on how they're activated, the number of platelets, the number of white cells? So this is one example uh, by Gus Mazaka's group to sort of uh, put some organization to this. There are several other groups, uh, uh, even locally here, that are emphasizing that we need to do a better job in trying to categorize this so we can get our arms around this entire problem. So what's next for PRP? Uh, we probably need to improve upon our formalization, standardization. Uh, the concept of now matching the pathology to what we use is now in, uh, more in vogue and sort of customizing our solutions. Uh, we clearly need to improve upon our studies. Even our level one studies that we've done at Rush, uh, we could do a much better job in terms of analyzing dose, frequency, process, and what we're actually putting in patients. But we're trying and we'll improve. Uh, every study we get better based on what we know. If we can do that, then we can we perform more high-quality meta-analyses that are actually comparing apples to apples. And then there's this movement, which you'll hear about over the course of the day, about combining PRB with other agents that may make sense or be synergistic, such as hyaluronic acid and anti-inflammatories. And then finally, as you sit here throughout the course of the day, let the evidence guide you in your decisions. That's ultimately what we all have. We all have that responsibility. So you're going to hear information that is presumably level one and maybe very good level of one evidence that supports some of those things in green. And you're going to see the least amount of evidence and the things that are in blue on the bottom. So keep your eyes and ears open and take, get some take homes in terms of what you can bring back to your own practices for the clinicians in the room. Thank you very much for your attention.